Jeff Gross and his movie uh, Return to Eden, which was in the New York City Independent Film Festival this past June, it was a great movie. And we're here talking to him about his ideas, why he made it. And was that your first movie you made? I've made a lot of films, small, large shorts, uh, video clips, etc., over the last 20 years. Uh, 25 years, but this is the first uh, feature that I've made, which is, you know, has a budget. Not that it had a huge budget, but it, yeah, it was a serious thing with a real DP, an excellent DP, et cetera, et cetera. And how did it work out? Was it fun? Was it stressful? <laughs> you, were you happy? Uh, it was the most stressful thing I've done in my life by a factor of 10, probably. Uh, it was a very complicated shoot, um, uh, kind of a controversial subject, which created all sorts of animosity in the small town where I live. Uh, so uh, nothing but obstacles, problems. Um, I'm astonished by what we managed to pull off. But, uh, you know, when I review the, the sacrifices, the time, uh, it's just unbelievable that something that good came out of it. Uh, the sacrifices yeah. showed. I guess that's what that, that was. Yes. Yes. Um, so who are some of your favorite filmmakers? Who who you look up to and say, you know, that's my idea of a good filmmaker and, and who I would love to emulate? Well, um, I lived in Paris for a long time and I worked on three different scripts with Roman Polanski. So that was more or less my film school. And I have tremendous, <laughs> I have tremendous re respect for him. Uh, uh, Lasse Halmström is one of my favorites. My Life as a Dog uh, was like just stunning and brilliant and poetic. Um, <clears throat> there's a film from an Argentine director named Fernando Solanas called Sur, which was I, I was very affected by. And uh, in Oliver Stone, some films, Natural Born Killers, I thought was a very interesting film. Uh, I actually had to the, the opportunity to meet him and uh, seemed like my version of the film or what he was trying to say was <laughs> not at all what he was trying to say. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's okay to be delusional, I guess. <laughs> yeah. How did you end up working with Plan Roman Polanski? And I, like, like, that's so awesome. I'm like, I'm so jealous of that concept. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, so originally I wanted to be a novelist. I was very much under the spell of Henry Miller as a young man and thought I'm going to move to Paris and be that person. Um, I'd gone to high school in Los Angeles and so found some buddies with whom I'd written a few scripts. So I was familiar with the form. Once I moved to Paris, I was definitely all about writing novels, which is, you know, a kind of quaint, uh, uh, anachronistic uh, notion is <laughs> how can you survive writing novels when people don't read anymore um, but then one day out of the blue I got a call from Warner Brothers asking me uh, if I wanted uh, if I would be willing to work on a film and they said I'm not supposed to tell you this but it's with Roman Polanski and I said yeah I mean that sounds that sounds interesting and a meeting was arranged and I came down to his house and um, originally the job was to uh, Polanski worked a lot with Gérard Brache um, on any number of films, a French screenwriter. Um, and so, uh, in theory, he was going to work with Brache. Brache was going to write the, the, the pages he wrote in French, and I was supposed to translate them. But um, Brache had been an agoraphobe for quite a while, and so his, his understanding of what was going on in Paris was weak. I sort of moved in, and Polanski and I opened up the story. Um, created a synopsis together and we worked 56 days straight on that and um, then had the first draft done of, of Frantic. Four years later my daughter was born right across the street from Polanski's house and I was sitting in the window with my daughter and he's with the binoculars four stories above across the street and um, at that point my uh, uh, starving writer career meant that I had like two and a half dollars in my pocket, mm -hmm. um, which is not great when you ha now have a child on the planet. You're just like, wow, total failure. And Polanski, you know, had me come up and uh, had me read scripts for him. And then finally, we ended up uh, writing Bitter Moon together. Um, so he saved my life. And I'm, you know, extremely grateful for that. Uh, but 
you know, the, the first day I worked with him, uh, he told me the story that he had in mind of Frantic. And he said, what do you think? And I said, is that it? And he's like, hmm, okay, this guy's not a kiss ass, I guess. And so he said, you know, the more uh, critical you are, the more skeptical you are, the better this project is going to be. So let's start working. We didn't have to worry about uh, appealing to other people because it's Polanski. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just to be able to write the film as it needs to be written, uh, that's a pleasure. And um, I, I don't know uh, if that's really a good thing if you're trying to be a, a functioning member of the film industry where it seems like mediocrity is the rule and, you know, compromise is the religion and, you know, which doesn't, doesn't make great films uh, as we see. See, I think there's room for great films. And I think great films do get made. They may not get made by the studios. It's like when you go back to like Lord the Flatbush and, you know, Pope of Greenwich Village, they were all made outside the studio and they started a whole genre of movies that were very different than what came before. And I think that that is also another thing that's starting to happen again. I, I totally agree. And, I, and, you know, the film medium is very, very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm right in the middle of, uh, you know, the roadblocks for, uh, you know, putting the movie out into the commercial realm, getting it into theaters. Um, I don't know if it's going to work uh, at this point. You know, I, I talk to so many people who say, oh, there's nothing I want to see on Netflix. I can't find anything. And that's certainly not the impression I get when people see the film in festivals. So, you know, hopefully some distributor will see the, the power of what I've done and see the, the, the crucial importance of it and say, OK, I believe in this. This has to be part of the discussion coming up to no next November. I know I interrupted you, but is there anything you want to like close with? Any any words of wisdom? Any any hopes, dreams, wants you want to you want to close out the interview with? There has to be a reason that you do it. There has to be a mission there. And if you're just thinking, oh wow, it's great to be an indie filmmaker and I could just make a film, and you know, um, I don't know if if <laughs> if you can actually pull that off if you don't have complete commitment. If there isn't a mission. If, you know, it's, it's, it's that thing that I feel America used to be about, which is let's get an idea and pull it through by power of will, by, you know, self-belief and uh, transcendence that uh, human beings can show in the right situations is, is the most important thing we have. And I feel like as a filmmaker, you have to be dialed into a sort of higher aspiration. You have to understand where people are going to be in six months and and what the what it is that your film is offering is a deep truth that people know inside them of themselves but have never brought to the surface has never articulated and when they see your film then they own that deep truth which they know and that's how the human race opens up so I agree i agree but thank you very much jeff for giving me your time I my totally pleasure i appreciate Dan. it and i love the conversation